Hi, welcome back to our series of videos on the safe and effective treatment of latent TB infection in community settings. I'm Justin Denham, the Medical Director of the Victorian Tuberculosis Program, and I'm delighted that you're keen to explore this in your own context. If you've been watching other videos in this series, you'd already have seen this management pathway, which has been designed especially for the diagnosis and management of latent TB in Australian general practices. Our earlier videos covered questions like, who is most appropriate to test for latent TB? How to interpret test results? excluding active TB disease, and treatment and follow-up using a standard course of isoniazid. Now that pathway is still appropriate, and it can be used to help guide latent TB treatment in your practice. However, isoniazid therapy might not be right for everybody. And in this video, we're going to talk about a newer alternative treatment, which uses a course of daily rifampicin therapy instead. As covered in previous training, isoniazid can be a safe and effective treatment for latent TB in appropriately selected patients, particularly those who are younger than 35 and have normal liver function tests before starting treatment. Those who are older or have existing liver function abnormalities or who start isoniazid and experience side effects can be recommended for referral to specialist ID clinics under the previous model. What we didn't cover in any detail was that when they arrive for review, many of these people would be offered treatment with a four-month course of daily rifampicin. Rifampicin is a good option for many, as it's equally effective in preventing TB, it's less likely to cause hepatotoxicity, and so it's safer in those at higher risk. While it has its own potential cautions, which we'll touch on shortly, it's therefore often a good option for people in whom isoniazid isn't appropriate. And it may be the best choice for someone you're considering treating in a general practice setting, as it can be used within the management pathway you're already familiar with. The most predictable issue related to rifampicin is that this antibiotic is a strong inducer of hepatic enzymes, and so can interfere in the metabolism of other drugs. When starting rifampicin, it's important to always check whether other medications a patient is taking will interfere in this way, and there are online resources that allow this quite easily. Some of the most common drugs with important interactions are the oral contraceptive pill, prednisolone and warfarin, all of which can have decreased effectiveness when used with rifampicin. Sometimes these medications can still continue to be used together with other supports, such as dose adjustment or increased monitoring. I often find that the first dose or two of rifampicin is accompanied by some mild nausea, which tends to settle with continued use. And like any antibiotic, other side effects such as rash or itch, gastrointestinal disturbance and hypersensitivity are possible. Finally, the red color of rifampicin tablets almost inevitably means that urine changes to be a reddish-orange color while on treatment. And occasionally this can also affect other body fluids, including tears. This isn't harmful, but patients must be warned about this ahead of time so that it doesn't come as a surprise. The dose of rifampicin for most adults will be 600 milligrams once a day. For those less than 45 kilograms, 10 milligrams per kilogram is appropriate. And as rifampicin comes in 150 and 300 milligram tablets, the usual adult dose for those who weigh less is 450 milligrams. One practical point for Australian GPs is that currently on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, isoniazid is listed for a treatment uh, of latent TB, but rifampicin is not. So prescribing it off PBS can lead to patient costs that we want to avoid. For those in Victoria, the Victorian Tuberculosis Program can supply rifampicin to your patients through a local pharmacy to avoid this issue. And the first time this happens, we'll need to make arrangements for delivery with them. So please get in touch with us directly to get this established. While on rifampicin, routinely review patients monthly to check adherence, medication supply, and for any side effects. No routine pathology testing during therapy is needed unless for other conditions. And like with isoniazid, repeating a test for latent TB is not undertaken after completion. At the end of treatment, documentation of therapy can be provided as outlined in video five. As an example, JR is a young woman from Malaysia who you've found to have latent TB. She's had a previous short attempt at isoniazid therapy, but discontinued because of gastrointestinal side effects, and she isn't keen to try again. You think that rifampicin might be a good option for her, but you notice that she's on the oral contraceptive pill. You discuss options with her, and you explain that the oral contraceptive is likely to be less effective while on rifampicin, including possibly some breakthrough menstruation, and it shouldn't be relied on for contraception. She's keen to take rifampicin on balance though, and she ultimately decides to continue taking the pill, but also to use barrier contraceptive, 
for the period of treatment to avoid pregnancy. So, in summary, a four-month course of daily rifampicin is equally effective as a six-month course of isoniazid for treating latent TB, and it can be considered as an alternative for suitable patients. Drug interaction is the major issue to be aware of and to check prior to prescribing. And to avoid concern, always warn patients to expect a color change to their urine during use.